Welcome to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, and thank you for being a part of our television ministry. Pulaski Heights is a place of warmth and love, with an outreach mission that extends far beyond our church walls. We have a long tradition of offering our hearts, stretching our minds, and extending Christ's hands to those in need. We are a congregation of hope and an open place of worship that seeks to share the good news beyond the conventional barriers of fellowship. Hi, I'm Brent Scott, a senior pastor at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. It is our desire that you will be inspired by today's message of hope for a diverse community in search of God's love. An hour and a half of instruction and conversation about the ministry of this congregation and, and our tradition as Christians, followers of Jesus. If you are interested in becoming a part of this church or simply want to know more, then we invite you to come today. You need not sign up, just simply show up at the parlor at noon and we'll be uh, delighted to welcome and greet you there. Notice the uh, information on the back of the Connect card as well. There is a lot there. We are trying this week to complete our Who Are You 2014 budget campaign emphasis. It's vitally important. If you have not turned in a card today, I urge you to do that today. Uh, there are cards located at either ends of the pews. If you need one, you may simply take one fill it out, seal it in the envelope, and that can be placed in the offering basket as well. You'll note finally on the back of the worship bulletin there are a number of important announcements, things happening in the life of this church. We're just about a week away from the season of Lent, and that means a lot of, a lot of uh, important gatherings together, important worship opportunities, and I encourage you to avail yourself of all of those. Once again, welcome to each and every one of you, and would you join with me as we're called to worship through prayer. Holy One, we gather in the midst of your great sanctuary, your congregation, to offer praises and prayers and love to you. May we love deeply. May we share what we have with you by also sharing with our neighbor. In your name we pray. Amen.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Turn your hearts to God's decrees and not to selfish gain. We will turn our eyes from looking at vanities and will find life in the ways of God. Let us follow the great commandment to love one another as we pass the peace of Christ. I invite you to turn in the back of your hymnal to the Psalter, page number 840. We will recite together Psalm 119, uh, verses 33 through 40, which are on the second page as you turn, but we will be singing response number one. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a seated. At this time I invite the children to join me on the steps for the lesson for young Christians as we all sing together. enjoying school this year? Great, great. Well, I'm, thank you all for, for coming forward. This morning, I have given you a piece of material. Will you all take and look at it? I have a big piece. I want you to take a look at this material. I want you first to look at the red side. What does that feel like? Feel soft? Thank you. Now let's turn it over. What does the other side feel like? Feels rough. Yes, well, the, this side is called uh, flannel, and it's nice and soft. And if you turn it over to the other side, feel it, it said it's rough. 
Well, now I don't want to mess this up, so listen very closely. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe that we all have a soft side and a side that can be kind of rough? Uh, in the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus talks about us loving one another and and even, and he says, he uses the word enemy, but uh, today you can interpret that as maybe a bully or somebody who's a little rough around the edges. Now, I've been accused of being a little rough around the edges at times, but that is why we all come to church and we study the Bible and we listen to the word of God preached by our pastor, because which side would you like to act like most of the time? The soft side? Have you all ever, uh, do you ever... Have you ever yelled at a brother or a friend or got mad at them? Well, you kind of showed them your rough side then. But, but in Christ, we forgive one another. We look over one another's faults, and we see one another's needs. And we try our best to put on our best face. If you look at us today in here, we all look like angels singing that opening hymn. But there are times when we can show our rough side. But thanks be to God who looks over our faults and sees our needs and teaches us to love one another. Uh, in spite of our faults. So I want you all to love one another and be nice and kind. And even if someone tries to bully you, you have to tell your teacher. But we're going to be nice even to them and hope they act better too in the future, okay? Okay, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for uh, children around the world as you continue to bless them to grow into the people you have called them to be. And bless us to love one another even when we show our rough side. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for coming. be with you. God of infinite grace and love, we are mindful of the boundaries we are so quick to draw, the boundaries that keep us apart. We know we easily hold others to rigid standards while allowing ourselves to get by on the minimum. We are so quick to criticize first and praise later. It is a wonder that we are bold enough to call ourselves your people. Yet we do call ourselves your people because of the gift of your grace, which accepts us as we are and invites us to grow in the light of your love. Help us, we pray, to be steadfast and diligent in our pursuit of the life of a faithful disciple. Lord, this morning, in the comfort and beauty of this sanctuary, we pray for the lost and the lonely, for those who are hungry and cold, for those who are in such utter pain that they can't see your light and they can't feel your love. Help us be an answer to this prayer by offering our love, by putting our love into action. In our own faith community today, we offer Christian sympathy to Valerie Angel and family in the death of her father, Jack Napple. We pray for those who have been hospitalized recently, Eulouise Bethay, Winston Faulkner, Katherine Jefferson, Brandy Rushton, Snooks Torrance, Joan Campbell, Rosemary Griffith, Wayne Lindsay, Angela Sanders, Betty Vickers, Bobby Everett, Edie Hunter, Jean Parker, and Terry Sanders. 
and we rejoice and give thanks for the birth of Charlotte Cameron LaFrance, child of Cassie and Jason LaFrance. We pray all of these prayers in the name of the one who came to show us what a life of love and grace looks like, Jesus the Christ, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to stand for the reading of the scripture which is Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 24 do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither not moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the eye is the lamp of the body so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. It stands as a pivotal moment in the history of our great state. On April 11, 2002, the University of Arkansas announced that it had received a significant financial gift from the Walton Family Charitable Foundation. Actually, a record-breaking gift. $300 million dollars the largest single gift ever given in the history of American public education. As a matter of fact, this gift was twice the size of the next largest gift of $150 million given only one month earlier to the University of Texas. Yes. <laughs> this gift would make a profound difference. And because Arkansas seems to consistently rank number 50 among the 50 states and the District of Columbia in the percentage of college graduates among the adult population, this gift served as notice that we are on our way up. Now, aside from all of this, the, the event itself, the, the gift was fairly unremarkable. I mean, it's happened before. Down through the history of this nation, <coughs> universities and colleges <coughs> and institutes and museums and, and occasionally even churches have received lavish gifts that allowed them to elevate their status, promote their ministry in the world, given by famous families like the Carnegie's the Stanfords, the DuPonts, and the Dukes, to name only a few. Now, when we hear this information, it, it leads us to make some natural assumptions. The assumption that perhaps this great nation was built on the epic contributions of the lavishly rich. This assumption would be wrong dead wrong. 
It's not true. Because the wealthy are not the most generous givers in this nation. As a matter of fact, the wealthiest, the top 20% of our population in this nation gives an average of 1.3% of their personal income over a given year. While the bottom 20%, the bottom 20% give an average of 3.2% to charity. More than twice the amount their wealthier counterparts offer. It's amazing. This is why, this is why states like Arkansas and Mississippi and Louisiana, while, while we always rank on the bottom rung of the national ladder in terms of education and, and, and personal income, we soar to the top. First, second, third place in terms of generosity and charitable giving. I mean, a wealthy New Yorker can't hold a candle to a small town or Kansan in terms of generosity. The question, however, is why? Why? Why do those who have less give more, generally speaking, and why do those who have more give less, generally speaking? I, we don't know. We don't know. Sociologists have, have scratched their heads. Some of them have assumed that perhaps the, the gene that causes people to, to, to move and drive themselves toward wealth is not conducive to sharing and being in community. But, but generally speaking, sociologists say there is no intrinsic difference in the haves and the have-nots. We're all cut out of the same piece of cloth. We're, we're all human beings. What has been noted, what has been noted, however, is, is that there seems to be a link. There seems to be a direct link between empathy and giving. Empathy and giving, or perhaps, should I say, between love, loving and giving. Those who tend to be more generous are those who are in touch with suffering and pain and hurt and need. They, they see it, they watch it, they've experienced it. They, they have a neighbor, they have a friend, an associate, someone they know who is in trouble. They, they tend to reach out and give. And so therefore, those who perhaps are well-to-do, those who live in cloistered, gated, homogenous communities, their lives protected, sealed, secure from the rest of the world, they neglect to see, or they're unable to see, the need. And therefore, they do not respond with love. They do not give of what they have to others. It's an interesting, interesting idea. It's kind of the old out-of-sight, out-of-mind principle. And it's a growing problem. It's a growing problem in our culture today. Not only among the wealthiest percentage of the population, but all of us, all of us, no, regardless of our, our bank account balance. I mean, there was a time, there was a time in our, in our collective memory when we, we made margin in our lives, we stopped, we, we paused, we looked around us to see, to see what was happening, to, to take stock of our neighbor, to, to reach out to help, to, to make a difference. We understood ourselves to, to be our brother's keeper, our, our sister's keeper, but not anymore. There's no margin. We don't pause, we don't contemplate, we don't pray, because increasingly we have become inward focused, focused on ourselves, our needs, our wants, those who are closest, those who are immediately around us, we, we fail to reach out to others. We pull up at a traffic light, and, and instead of seeing that haggard looking soul pushing the, the beat up shopping cart with plastic bottles and, and trash bags overflowing, as she passes through the crosswalk, wondering where she has been, where she's going, what we might be able to do, what we might be able to do to, to elevate, to support, to, 
to offer care. We never see her. In fact, we often literally never see her. Because when we stop at that light, we immediately look down and check our text messages or our email or we fiddle with the radio dial or we take a sip of our biggie drink or, or a bite of our double cheeseburger or, or reapply eye mascara or, or just our underwear, whatever. <laughs> we totally miss it. And quite frankly, those of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord aren't much different than our neighbors. We're not. We're about as self-centered and in-returned as the next person. I mean, how many times does your church have to ask you to turn in a simple commitment card? To simply ask you to live out the very promise you made when you stood right here and promised to support Christ and His church with your prayers, your presence, your financial gifts, your service, and your witness. We're oblivious. We're oblivious. I'm reminded, reminded of the joke about the wealthy man who died and, and went to heaven. And when he got there, he was absolutely enthralled. He was excited about what he found. It wasn't too different from what he had left behind. Lush neighborhoods with beautiful lawns and lavish homes and, and, and mansions. It was beautiful. But when the angel took the man to a ramshackle shack and informed him that this would be his heavenly abode, he blew up. So what is this? Why don't I get a nice house? Why don't I have a mansion? Why don't I have the, the lush lawn? And the angel simply said, this was the best we could build with what you sent ahead. <laughs> There's so much truth to it. There's so much truth to it. We, we are called we're called by God to love others by giving to others. We are called to throw caution to the wind and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and to visit those who are in prison. This is what Jesus commands us to do in so many places. Also, especially in this place, in this text we find from his Sermon on the Mount. Listen again to these words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there is your heart also. It's the greatest lesson that we can ever learn. That love, love, loving is giving. It's the ultimate letting go and trusting God. This past week, this past Thursday to be exact, I quietly observed the 36th anniversary of my father's death. It has been so long now. I sometimes struggle to see his image, or even hear the sound of his voice. But the, but the lessons he taught me are stored up in my heart, and they come forth continually. I remember when I was young, uh, a young boy, maybe six, seven years old, our, our community announced that a new industry was coming in. The, the community would build a shirt factory that would provide jobs and, and boost the economy and generally elevate the entire community. The, the little town was elated, ecstatic. Everyone was excited. The only thing, however, is that the factory was going, going to be built directly next to my childhood home the place I was raised. Now, you know, any, any homeowner would go ballistic and explode and fight City Hall and, and see how to undo this terrible thing, and yet my father was thrilled about it. He pushed it. He was, he was excited about what was happening. He wanted his community to prosper to the degree that when the factory finally began to rise from the ground and and the community realized that they had not allowed enough space between our lawn and the shirt factory to provide an access road, my father 
gave away a slice of our land, just donated it to the community for, for free. He, he gave it away simply because he had this gift for loving others and wanting, wanting the community to be filled with light and love. Jesus says further in his great sermon, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of sight. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? In, in Jesus' day and time, uh, the human eye was not, was not understood to be a, a, a window or a lens through which we received images and light and, and we took in all the things that were around us. Rather, the eye was viewed or understood to be a lamp, a kind of projector, if you will, whereby individuals were called to project light on the world, to give away, to make a difference, to offer some hope to others. Essentially here, Jesus is telling us to not live in darkness, to let our light shine to be salt and light to the world and to not huddle away and separate ourselves in darkness from others. In one of the uh, darker moments in her life, popular Christian writer, lecturer, personality, Anne Lamont tells of uh, the time she took her then six-year-old son, son, Sam, on a book signing tour with her. One day they were sitting in a bookstore at a table and there were a line of people and Anne was signing book after book. Sam, six-year-old Sam, was, was standing at her side when suddenly a woman appeared who also had a child next to her, a, a little boy, Sam's age. As Anne signed the, the woman's book, she began to make small talk with Anne and chit-chat about parenthood. And, and the woman made the tragic mistake of saying, you know, I just got through making... Play-Doh from scratch for my son this morning. Do you make Sam's Play-Doh? I don't make Sam's dinner. And shot back. Still cheerful, the nice woman said, well then, what does Sam eat? <laughs> Snack platters. And shot back with a darts in her eyes. Later that evening, back at the hotel, Anne followed her usual pattern of ordering herself two entrees through room service. And when the food was brought, she tore off bits and pieces of each entree and put it on a platter. That was Sam's snack platter. And then she ate all the rest. After dinner, she was so tired, so exhausted, too exhausted to even brush her teeth or take off her clothing. She just collapsed on the bed and curled up in her dark little fetal position was at that moment she heard the sound of Sam's voice. Mom, can I ask you something? Can it wait? Anne barked back at her child. And there was silence. And then a few moments later, she heard the sound of Sam's voice again. Mom, have you ever loved someone who didn't love you back? And for Anne Lamont, the light suddenly came on and the darkness was dispelled. And, and she said she pulled her, her tired, worthless carcass up from its, from its position to a sitting position on the bed. She reached out her arms and she embraced her son. And as she held him, she said, yes, I once loved someone who did not love me. And it felt like a knife in my heart. And then a moment later, Sam spoke again. He said, Mom, can I ask you one more thing? And dreading it, Anne said, Yes, I suppose. And Sam said, do you, think, do you think that both of us will die at the exact same moment so that we can be together? There is so much darkness out there. There is so much sadness. There is so much need for love. 
You know all those treasures you've been storing up for yourself? All those things that you hold tightly, that you believe belong to you and you alone, and, and you will not let go of things like your money and your things and your time and even your prayers. Do you know that you can make a profound difference if you stopped storing up and started giving in love? As we continue this journey in learning about our hymnody and our quest to be better participants and singers in worship, I was reminded that there are so many different sources in which our hymns and tunes come from. Did you know that A Mighty Fortress actually had a very wild kind of rhythmic tempo in its origin? And Silent Night that we love so dearly that both of those tunes that I just mentioned actually came from the taverns of Europe. Silent Night was sung as a very fast tune. It was a Tyrolean singing song. So this number 408 that we have today, The Gift of Love, actually started as a secular love tune. And its, name, its, its uh, tune name was O Wally Wally. And it came across the big ocean with our ancestors, and then we claimed it as an American hymn tune. And as you can see, uh, it's called The Gift of Love. Many composers and arrangers in the United States have set this tune to different words. In fact, in a few weeks when we get to Holy Week, our choir is going to be singing this very same tune to the words of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. So today, um, this particular text that Hal Hobson has arranged actually comes to us from 1 Corinthians 13. And it is a paraphrased version of the first three verses of 1 Corinthians. Because it's been arranged so many ways, one of the most famous ways is this Hal Hobson setting, which we also have as an anthem. So I have asked Anne this morning to play that accompaniment as we all sing together. So if you'll just follow me, it goes like this.
Stephen Ministry is a program that equips laypersons with 50 hours of training to provide distinctively one-on-one -on -one Christian caregiving to those who are experiencing all kinds of life circumstances. Members of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, it is my pleasure to present these persons to serve our congregation and community as Stephen ministers. They are being escorted today by Carol Ann Proven, who's our leadership team coordinator. Jean Altenberger, Debbie Benson, Susan Branton, Meg Casey, Sharon Ditter, Louise Fox, Sally Jones, Grace Ellen Rice, and Andrea Wimes. Will all active and inactive Stephen ministers please stand and remain standing. And now I ask these, uh, while our active and inactive remain standing, I ask these questions to our Steve, new Stephen ministers. As the Lord Jesus has revealed his presence to you through faith, we ask you to share your personal experience of faith with those around you so that they too may celebrate the presence of Christ in our world today. Are you prepared to meet this request which we ask of you? If so, please answer yes with the help of God. Are you prepared to nurture the skills you have learned and use them in service to others to support, encourage, build up, and comfort people in all their needs? If so, please answer yes with the help of God. And now to the congregation, I have two questions for you. Now we ask you, members of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, to open your hearts to the ministry of these people and to pray for them that they may be effective servants of Christ. Are you prepared to meet this request? If so, please answer yes with the help of God. Yes. We also ask you to accept their ministry when you need help to allow these individuals to work with you as you face struggles in your life, that you might receive support and help from your brothers and sisters. If you would do this, please answer yes with the help of God. Yes. Because you have promised faithfully to serve God and the people of Christ as Stephen ministers, I commend to you the care and guidance of the Holy Spirit as you in turn care for others, act boldly and without fear, for Christ is with you. Let us pray. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. And following, following the service today, you're invited to greet and welcome our new Stephen ministers in the Welcome Center. As the ushers come forward to receive our offering, we give thanks to God for all the ways uh, that your support uh, helps our church reach out to the community and the world. Did you know that last night, Cindy Burns led our PEEPS ministry? PEEPS stands for Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church Evening of Excursion for Parents of Children with Special Needs. In your church, we had 36 volunteers and 17 children from around the city, not only at your church, who enjoyed uh, three hours of, of, of fun while their parents uh, had a respite. And one parent said, we only had three hours, but we were refreshed as if it were a week. Also, your youth are having a clothing drive for the homeless today for people of the Compassion Center, and those clothes are being collected in the gym. All these ministries are supported by your gifts to the operating budget. And if you have not completed an operating budget commitment card, we hope that you would do that today and place it in the offering basket with your tithes and your offerings. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all the opportunities you give us to reach out to others. Bless our tithes and our offerings now as we reach out to people locally and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Will you join me as we affirm our faith together? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Love is not taking, love is giving, and in Jesus Christ we have received the perfect example of perfect love poured out and given for us. Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church reaches out, reaches out to this community and in fact the entire world with the good news of Christ by feeding and clothing and caring for others. If you're interested, if you would like to know more about this special community of faith, our membership matters class is at noon today, we would love to have you join us and be a part of the great things happening here. Let us remain standing as we sing together. Today is your first time to worship with us at Pulaski Heights United Methodist, then we have been honored by your presence and we would like to honor you by giving you a gift as you exit this sanctuary. It's a blue bag filled with a coffee mug and other information about our many ministries. Take it as a gift 
of uh, community and love from us to you, and we invite you to join us again. Also, if you would like to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, it will be served immediately following the service. Just go through the back doors and across the colonnade, and you will find yourself in the location of Shamblin Chapel, where there are those ready and waiting to serve you. And then finally, following the service today, I encourage you to go by uh, the Welcome Center through these doors and offer thanks and appreciation to our newly trained Stephen Ministries for the ministry they offer here in the community and throughout the world as well. And then finally, Reverend Belinda Price is our staff host. Belinda will remain here at the front. If you have any questions or need any directions, she would love to offer those for you today. So go forth to serve God and serve neighbor, to love God and to love neighbor by giving of yourself in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. And I hope you enjoyed our worship service. May the peace, joy, and love of God be with you.